Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's SpaceX 3 status news conference. We are pleased today to be joined by telephone from Houston, the Johnson Space Center, Mr. Mike Seferdini, the International Space Station Program Manager. Here in Florida, Mr. Hans Koenigsman, Vice President of Mission Assurance for SpaceX, and Mike McAleenan, Launch Weather Officer from the U.S. Air Force 45th Weather Squadron. And we will begin with opening comments from our presenters, and then we'll be happy to take questions after that. We'll start with Mr. Suffordini. Mike? Thank you, Mike. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this morning we concluded uh, our mission management team meeting uh, in preparation for uh, the SpaceX-3 uh, launch. Um, of course, we had already determined that we were ready for the launch uh, last week, uh, early last week. However, uh, Friday afternoon, uh, one of our external MDMs uh, failed. We call it EXT2. Uh, it controls uh, many of the functions on what we refer to as the inboard portion of the truss, everything from the solar alpha rotary joints, the big uh, solar array joints uh, inboard. Uh, this includes the thermal cooling system, the, uh, the solar alpha joint itself, the radiators, the mobile transporter, and a number of other uh, systems uh, that we had insight into. So given this uh, particular failure of, uh, of this MDM, which uh, per our launch commit criteria is required uh, prior to launch of uh, any of the vehicles that we need to berth, uh, the team had to go uh, look at all the scenarios and see if we could figure out a way to, um, to fly the SpaceX vehicle. Of course, SpaceX is carrying on board a number of critical systems, including um, a new spacesuit, um, uh, components to fix uh, the existing spacesuits, um, a couple of uh, very critical uh, research experiments in the trunk, and uh, quite, a be quite a bit of logistics uh, for our crew members on board. And, uh, and so we, uh, we need to get it on board uh, as soon as we uh, practically can. Uh, the team has spent the last two days uh, looking at options to recover from this scenario. Uh, it turns out that um, the biggest driver for us is uh, the positioning of the solar rays as we look to the next failure, which is really uh, what the concern is. Uh, this box is uh, completely redundant with the primary EXT-1 box, so today we have full functionality. However, uh, our, our job is to convince ourselves that given the next failure, we could still accept uh, the SpaceX uh, spacecraft. And so the team has worked that. Uh, as I started to say earlier, the biggest driver was the, the solar arrays. You know, whenever a vehicle approaches, we have to configure the arrays uh, such that the pluming from the thrusters as the spacecraft approaches doesn't put unnecessary loads on the, uh, on the solar arrays. Um, but we also have to have the solar arrays pointed so they provide uh, sig sufficient power to operate the station. And so there's always that, uh, that trade we have to make uh, when any vehicle arrives. Of course, in this case, we had to also protect ourselves for power uh, all the way from launch of the, of the spacecraft to the ISS, and that is indeed what the team was able to find out. Fortunately, we are in a lower beta uh, angle over the next uh, couple, three weeks, and so that provided us an opportunity to find a solar array position that will protect us. Uh, and uh, in addition to that, uh, the mobile transporter uh, needs to be at work site two to begin the uh, trunk ops. We can grapple, we will grapple the Dragon from node two, which is not affected by this, but uh, shortly after the spacecraft arrives, we have to get on with removing the payloads from the trunk. The first place we have to be is to have the MT out at, uh, out at work site two. Uh, in addition to that, it's currently at work site four and in the way of any EVA to replace uh, the EX2, EXT2 MDM. And so uh, we, will, we will also move that in preparations for the launch. Uh, so, so the plan going forward is um, we will uh, move the solar rays right after launch to a position and fix them there. Um, and then uh, if anything occurs between launch and, um, and berthing, uh, we will still be able to accept the, um, this Dragon spacecraft. So in that respect, we have recovered essentially the redundancy the LCC is protecting for, and we're good to go. In addition to that, then, uh, we have to make plans to go ahead and replace this MDM, and we should do it relatively uh, quickly whenever we can safely do that. 
the teams have been thinking about what suits uh, that we would use. Um, and uh, the plan now is to use uh, suit 3011, which was used on a previous uh, EVA and, um, and has a new fan pump set that's only been exposed to uh, a couple of uh, EVAs. And um, 3005, which will get a new uh, fan pump set uh, prior to the start of the EVA. And just to quickly review uh, the issue with the suits uh, so that it kind of makes sense, uh, as you know, it turns out the result of the anomaly, the cause, excuse me, the cause of the anomaly um, was the result of contamination that was introduced uh, by filters that were essentially uh, used to, uh, meant to uh, clean and scrub the water loops for us. Um, those uh, introduced a large amount of silica into the system, uh, and that silica eventually coagulates um, in the area of the, of the fan pump sep, and um, after many uses, it eventually can build up to the point where it plugs the holes, and you can't separate the water from the air, and the water then finds its way into the suit. Uh, prior to the last uh, contingency EVA we had to do, we changed out the fan pump sep on 3011, which was the failed suit, and it worked fine, um, and we'll get a new fan pump sep in 3005. In addition to that, we've got new filters on board that we know are clean. Um, and in addition to that, we have over the last week, and we'll we'll finish it up uh, early next week. Um, we are flushed. We've flushed the cooling lines and replaced the water in uh, in both the cooling lines um, in the uh, station system itself, and um, and all three of the suits. So they have fresh water. Um, with uh, that have been purged to uh, eliminate, well, reduce significantly the amount of silica in the water uh, today. And so we believe we're in a very good uh, posture for the EVA. Uh, if for any reason we have a problem uh, changing out the fan pump set on, uh, on 3005, we have a new suit that's coming up. Uh, that requires some checkout and some more uh, work to have it ready to go, but it's a possibility. And we have a new fan pump set coming up on the Dragon spacecraft as well, which we could use and install in, uh, in 3010, another suit that's on orbit, to have it ready. So we have many options. Uh, however, in order to preserve the opportunity to do the EVA, as soon as we can um, after the Dragon arrives, we're going to go ahead and prep 3005, and the team believes um, the best suit combination for the EVA would be 3005 with the new fan pump set and, uh, and the 3011 uh, suit. Uh, so with that, uh, the team uh, concluded uh, the MMT with a go for uh, SpaceX-3, a go to move the MT to work site 2 this afternoon at about 3 o'clock local time, and, uh, and to get the solar ray, uh, new solar ray angles on board uh, so that we can protect ourselves for the next worst failure should it occur. Uh, and, the, uh, and the teams are marching uh, to that direction. And that's, uh, that concludes my opening comments. Okay, very good. Thank you. Hans? Yeah, um, thank you. Um, we, are, I took it, uh, we, we are at a, a really good spot, too. We are, um, worked very hard over the last couple of weeks to, to get uh, ready to launch. The launch is currently scheduled for... Um, 4:58 on Monday, uh, 44 seconds, <laughs> and uh, and the, the 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 reason the reason this is so so precise is that the launch window basically is instantaneous. That is uh, the, the same as it was for the shuttle basically. But um, we, we, the goal is to catch the plane that the uh, the ISS flies in and then um, chase it and and uh, perform the rendezvous. Uh, I do want to give you a little bit of an uh, introduction into the timeline uh, when we lived off. We have uh, the first stage of Falcon 9 burning for about uh, 2 minutes and 40 seconds. Uh, then we have main engine cut down, uh, shutdown and uh, followed by a stage separation about 3.5 seconds later and followed by a second stage ignition about 7.5 seconds later. The uh, second stage engine burns for a total of close to 7 minutes. Uh, about 40 seconds into the second second stage flight, it will deploy the nose cone. Um, you might be able to catch this on the video. You got to look at the uh, far right or left corner. I forgot which one it is, but it's uh, it's difficult to see, but you can see it. And uh, then uh, again, about nine nine minutes 40 seconds after liftoff, the uh, second stage engine will shut down. 
and the vehicle is in a 325 by 325, basically uh, essentially circular orbit um, with uh, 51, I forgot the exact number, I think it's 5.4, 51.54 degree inclination, exactly uh, the same as the uh, space station. It's uh, deploying Dragon about 35 seconds after second stage shutdown. Uh, Dragon will, will uh, move away from the uh, second stage. The uh, second stage will perform a maneuver to get further away from Dragon. Dragon will um, deploy the solar arrays. Um, there's fairings over it, and um, when we deploy those fairings about two minutes into flight, um, you can see the solar arrays coming out. Um, we have a video link to confirm that. And um, from then on, the mission is basically handed over to um, our mission control in Hawthorne. Um, the second stage will continue to perform some secondary um, objectives. It will deploy P-Pots. Um, in total, there are four P-Pots, are these canisters that contain small satellites. There's four of them on board, um, and they contain a total of um, well, three of them contain one satellite, and one of them contains two satellites. And then one of the satellites actually contains very small satellites called, called basically femto satellites. They are like uh, printed circuit boards. And I believe the number was 141 or 101. Um, <laughs> these are very small satellites, basically. They, they will be deployed on command, and the, the reason it's on a, on a special command is so that they don't... Uh, spread debris in, in the orbit. Um, so it's going to be a while after, you know, after Dragon is gone and uh, second stage is gone. So um, moving on Dragon, Dragon will perform um, maneuvers to basically get to a higher orbit and to, to be closer to the station. Um, at about uh, 10 kilometers out um, under the station, it will perform proximity operations. And that is a, a joint uh, operation between SpaceX and Hawthorne and um, the ISS team in, in, in Houston, it's very exciting. And uh, we, we will see a, um, a uh, dragon climbing up the arbor, which is the vertical um, approach basically to the station, uh, about 30 hours uh, with a uh, grappling at uh, 38 hours um, after, after liftoff. And uh, I can tell you I'm, I'm super thrilled that uh, we are at the spot here where we are close to launch and, uh, and ready to go. All right. Thank you, Hans. Mike. Good afternoon. Unfortunately, we can't launch today <laughs> because it's been uh, spectacular weather the next, uh, last three or four days. Uh, tomorrow is a bit of a transition day, and we have a couple of factors that are going to influence um, the weather in over Florida for tomorrow. If I could have a satellite picture, you could see. Uh, just in the southern part of the peninsula, uh, by the Bahamas, that's a frontal boundary that's going to work its way back to the north over the next uh, day and a half. Uh, that's what came through the last couple of days and has cleared out and made us uh, some beautiful weather. Also, you can see a huge weather maker moving into the uh, southeast U.S. Uh, that is going to be uh, approaching the area in the center part of the Gulf, uh, maybe in the Panhandle by uh, launch time tomorrow. And on Tuesday, you can pretty much take that whole mass of clouds and plop it over the uh, Florida Peninsula. Uh, it looks really bad on Tuesday, but uh, again, I think it's going to be uh, slow enough that it's not going to impact the launch. If we'd have the uh, forecast up for the forecast for launch, um, again, with that uh, frontal bound moving in from the west, I think we're going to have some uh, instability uh, greater than we have had the last couple of days. We've only seen small cumulus clouds, and that's going to allow the thunderstorms to uh, perhaps grow in the central part of the US, uh, Florida. And uh, with our westerly winds aloft, that could bring some of those upper-level clouds back over. So those are a threat to launch. And uh, so the main concern is those anvil clouds streaming back over the east side of Florida over the launch pad um, uh, for our uh, probability of violation at 10 percent. And that's uh, the main threat. Otherwise, weather looks pretty good. Uh, warm temperatures remain. And again, we'll just watch those increasing clouds through the countdown. If we were to delay uh, through to Friday, the next opportunity, um, that frontal boundary, unlike the last one, is not going to go all the way down to the Straits of Florida and to the Keys. It's going to kind of linger in Central Florida area. And that's going to give us uh, thick clouds off and on through the next, next uh, four or five days and uh, periods of rain. So not quite as good forecast for Friday. Uh, Friday's attempt was a 60% probability violation. Uh, flight through precipitation with those showers as well as thick clouds are all a, a possibility. So again, 60% chance for Friday, uh, but it looks like overall a fairly decent shot on, uh, on Monday. Thank you very much.
Okay, Mike, thank you. Uh, now we're going to take questions. We're pleased today to be joined not only by uh, members of the news media, but members of the social media crowd here at Kennedy Space Center. And we may also have some participants on the phone bridge. And due to the fact that Mr. Suffordini is joining us by telephone and we have three mics and one Hans, it would help if you could please address your question to, uh, to whom you are asking it. Uh, also, please wait for the microphone. And uh, we'll start off with Marcia Dunn. Marcia Dunn, Associated Press for Mike. Um, do you have any idea what happened to that MDM? Why did it fail? And for the spacewalk, what's the soonest you think you could uh, pull that off? Uh, uh, Marcia, no, we don't know why it failed. We were we were bringing it up, and it didn't it didn't come up. Um, and so, uh, and we know by the current draw that the uh, that it's not operating properly at all. So, uh, but we don't. We don't know the root cause of the, the anomaly. Uh, and today we plan uh, EVA 26 on the 22nd is our current plan, right before the 53P undock and, and redock plan. Irene? Um, Irene Klotz uh, with Reuters, uh, also for you, Mike Seferdini. Um What would be the plan if for some reason uh, the Falcon 9 can't launch uh, tomorrow um, as far as the um, things that you're going to be doing to protect against um, another MDM failure, does that impact the, uh, um, uh, would the launch go forward then on, on Friday? And also, why isn't um, there a day available before Friday? Is that a range or an ISS issue? Thanks. Uh, the answer to your second question is it's just the way the orbital mechanics work out um, and and the fact that we're trying for a rendezvous within a certain amount of time uh, for the research. So in order to protect uh, the amount of time it takes to rendezvous, um, it turns out the 18th is the next um, good candidate uh, for launch. Um, the plan today is we would continue on the preparations uh, for the EVA uh, and uh, keep the solar rays um, in the fixed position. We're going to put them uh, uh, that we had planned to put them in so that we're protected. And uh, no, I'm sorry, I, I take that back. What we will do is we will keep um, the the position we want the solar rays to be at loaded on board, and we will not go there until the 18th. But the software is set up such that if we have the next failure, it will automatically put the arrays in the right position. Um, and so we will wait for the SpaceX vehicle to show up uh, and then perform the EVA. At least that's our current plan with the 18th as the as the launch date. And uh, part of the reason is there's um, there's a, I'll call it a gasket, it's not really a gasket, but that gives you the right image. It's a, some material that we have to affix to the bottom of the MDM. It's called coal therm. It just allows you better heat conductivity between the, the MDM itself um, and the coal plate it sits on. And um, while we have some on orbit, we don't have the proper one for this particular MDM. We have a backup plan if we if we can't get a SpaceX vehicle there. But given the time it takes us to get ready for the EVA anyway, um, the plan uh, today, at least the way we think about it today, is that we would uh, wait till the 18th, have SpaceX launch and berth, and then we do the EVA um, sometime shortly after that. But we'd have to work out those details. Uh, Bill Harwood. Hi, Bill Harwood, CBS News for Mike. Uh, a couple of really quick ones. Um, who would do the EVA? Where does orbital go uh, if SpaceX launches on time? Where does which slot does orbital end up in? And then I have one follow-up. Uh, we will decide today who does the EVA. Um, the orbital guys, uh, once SpaceX berths, we're going to send them to the other side of the beta cutout. Um, they'll probably berth. Uh, I don't know exactly, but it's sometime after the beta cutout on the ninth. It's probably like the twelfth, but uh, we haven't finalized that yet. The birth, the birth time would be the 12th. We'll have to look at launch opportunities and things like that. Thanks. And then one, one kind of philosophical question. You know, you guys have trained us successfully over the years to know how important redundancy is. And I guess my question is, what were the factors that made you decide it was more important to launch SpaceX before you did an EVA to replace the MDM? I'm just curious if there's any other details you can share about uh, the logic of that. Thanks. Yes, and it's good that we've trained you guys so that you make sure you ask us that each time. So essentially where we ended up, Bill, because of the uh, beta that we're in, we're able to essentially get 
get back the redundancy we need uh, because we can position the solar arrays um, such that we're okay. The thermal control system will take care of itself. It has all of its protections. Um, even though we can't command it, um, we can, it can still operate itself. Uh, the mobile transporter uh, we'd lose, but we're, we, it wouldn't be as big a deal if SpaceX wasn't there. So in that respect, once we move it off of Worksite 4 so we can get to the MDMs, it's not a huge deal. And then the last big system is the, the TARGE itself. Well, we operate the TARGE in a pretty much fixed position most of the time, and that's where it is today. So once you sort out those issues, you realize you have full redundancy on the thermal control system. Uh, we're going to move the MT today, and so we'll have it out of the way so we can do the EVA. Um, and we have the solar array position that protects us for many days, as if we'd have had as if we had a, the next failure. Then we're in a we're in a good position, as if we do have the redundancy that the LCC calls for. The reason why we want to get the SpaceX vehicle up is, as you know, we've been kind of slipping a little bit to the right. Uh, while we've been consuming our resources on board, we reach a skip cycle on food, which is 45 days. We reach skip cycle on food on June the 18th. Uh, so there's a, you know, there's a certain amount of urgency to go ahead and get these vehicles on ISS, you know, as soon as we safely can do that. And so perhaps what you're thinking is what we would consider doing is waiting with the EVA. But if we wait, you're going to go past the 18th. Um, and then you got to find the next opportunity for SpaceX or decide that you could put orbital in. Then you have the crew rotation and the cutout. Now you're on the other side of June, and then we got all the things that have to happen in the summertime. Um, and so things start to bunch up, and, uh, and so we're just trying to fly uh, as soon as we safely can, which is what we believe we're doing in this position. James. Thanks. Uh, James, Dane Floor today. Hans, I wonder if you could discuss a little bit your plans to try to recover the first stage. Um, how are you going to go about that? What what it involves, and what you'll, you, when do you think you might be able to to tell us about how it goes? If we'll see anything, and and as well for Mr. Suffordini, I was wondering if if you could address uh, NASA's interest in in that event, although obviously not really relevant to the Dragon flight. But how are you supporting? Was there any any issues? Uh, from NASA's perspective about trying that and putting the landing legs on this vehicle? Yeah, you mentioned the landing legs. Uh, we have landing legs on this vehicle, four of them, 25 feet tall. And um, the I, I must point out that the entire um, recovery of the first stage is completely experimental. It has nothing to do with the primary mission here. Um, the stage separates and then waits a while until the second stage goes far away and uh, and then starts starts basically going going through a sequence um, that is completely experimental. Uh, we are super thrilled, you know, if the first step works. Overall, we're expecting 30, 40 percent, maybe uh, really lowballing the 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 uh, probability of success here, um, because this is this is a, a really difficult uh, <laughs> difficult maneuver. Um, we have a, a boat, down, boat downrange, and uh, we will perform a entry burn and a landing burn. We will pretend the water is the is, is land basically, and uh, and have a, a, a touchdown of the stage. Um, and um, if that if that would happen, we would be super thrilled. If uh, you know, if we just do a good entry burn, uh, we would be super thrilled too. So again, the expectations aren't very high on our side, um, but we certainly. Uh, we, we've been doing improvements uh, to the to the uh, recovery of the first stage uh, in, in little steps, um, being very careful that it doesn't affect the safety and the, the reliability of Dragon. Uh, Mike, did you want to address the other question? Uh, yes. So uh, other than just being, uh, you know, space geeks and very excited about this idea and, and uh, seeing it uh, come to fruition, we have a couple of responsibilities uh, as an agency. One is uh, to support... Uh, commercial um, use of, of uh, space, which uh, obviously this uh, is uh, working towards uh, low-cost uh, access to space. Um, but the more immediate responsibility of the International Space Station program is to ensure that any modifications like this do not put uh, the flight at risk such that we're uncomfortable putting our payloads on the Dragon spacecraft. So our review of this was in two areas, one in terms of the impact to performance 
specifically worry that you don't want to take out too much of your engine out capability. Well, this the added mass is very very small con uh, when you compare that to the overall performance of the of the uh, uh, 1.1 version of the Falcon 9 uh, vehicle, and so in that respect, there was really uh, no appreciable uh, impact. In addition to that, of course, we didn't want to make we wanted to make sure the design was such that the legs wouldn't prematurely deploy uh, during ascent. So we looked at the system design and and were comfortable that the redundancies are there to protect them from inadvertent uh, deploy. And then, of course, after that, um, it's like you said, once we're convinced that it won't affect dragon performance, then anything we can do to 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 help out, uh, we we uh, feel obligated to do. Jay Barbary. Jay Barbary with NBC. This is for Hans and you too, Mike. Um, it looks, uh, as things stand today, that the most likely spacecraft, American spacecraft, to visit the space station with astronauts will be uh, SpaceX's uh, spacecraft. Hans, where do we stand as of this time? What has to be done before SpaceX can fly astronauts to and from the space station? What's the best guest on your time? And Mike, if you'd like to add anything, we'd like to hear from you. So I'm acting as the launch chief engineer for this mission, and I'm super focused on this mission. In fact, I've been here for a couple of weeks now and not doing anything but work on it. <laughs> so <laughs> I, uh, I, I'm not sure I can really answer the question as, as good as you want an answer, but I can tell you that in, gen yes, in, in general, I can tell you we are proceeding on our side with our, our crew, um, crew Dragon program right now. We're meeting the milestones. We have a couple of flight tests coming up later this year. It's going to be exciting. Um, and I really don't know any more details in terms of uh, what needs to be done in the, in the long run. You have no idea now no, where that might be in two years, three years, four I, years. And Mike, what do you have to see from SpaceX before you'll let them visit your space station? All right. Well, let's see. Uh, I'll be equally uh, unimpressive for you, uh, Jay. Um, you know, we have uh, the commercial crew program, uh, which uh, I do not manage, um, is working on a process to try to get us uh, a capability that we then can procure. Uh, in that process, we have defined our requirements for the International Space Station in order for a vehicle to come and approach ISS and, and carry our crew. Um, to ISS, and those requirements are in the most latest procurement that is out there uh, that, in fact, we've received proposals for, so we're very sensitive about any conversations along those lines. Uh, but just to the extent um, that the International Space Station uh, needs uh, commercial crew capability, and we've said as an agency and an administration that that's our, our goal and our focus, uh, we have provided our requirements, and we're uh, in the process and the next step in the procurement. Um, and uh, and we just look forward to uh, to the capability when it uh, when it arrives and uh, and whoever provides it. We'll take. Uh, Can you give us any time frame at all? Are we talking two years, three years, six years, forty years? What? I can tell you that the next step in the process is the development contract, and uh, they're trying to make that selection here in the fall. Uh, we assume uh, that we will have an ability to put increment crew members on a commercial vehicle in 2018. So we've procured seats from our Russian counterparts through 2017, and we uh, are looking forward to a commercial crew capability uh, uh, in 2018. Now that's to put increment crews. Uh, you might hear some folks talk they can go earlier than that with demonstration crews and the like, and we're prepared to support that uh, if they're ready. We'll take one more here before we uh, go to the phone bridge. Jason. Jason Ryan for SpaceFlightInsider.com. And this one goes out to Hans. With, uh, also back up to uh, uh, Mike. It's, it's a question of timing. Um, CRS-3, SpaceX-3 has slipped best number I have at the top of my head, I think is six times. And we've seen that due to the, the skirting issue, due to the, the range issue, which also delayed another uh, launch. Um, CRS, if, if memory serves, is supposed to supply services through 2016. Uh, SpaceX seems to launch about the rate of two to three times a year. Um, is, is that 2016 a hard and fast date, or is it more nebulous? If, if, if SpaceX doesn't meet the 12 missions by 2016, will there be a penalty, or will it just be extended? How, do, how, is that, how does that work? So 
I honestly don't know the answer to your last question, but I can tell you that the um, plan is not to launch two or three missions a year. And we, in fact, we we did demonstrate over um, the last the end of the last year that we can launch basically within a month. It was uh, a month and a day or so. So um, the we are taking we are taking the actions to increase the launch rate dramatically, and go basically um, you know to to uh, being capable to launch within. Uh, Three weeks, two weeks, um, and 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 fa always faster as you know as, as uh, time goes on. But um, the so I, I'm not I'm also not sure if the CRS mission really uh, slipped that much um, overall. Um, they were uh, dragon dragon missions typically are, are a little bit more complex. I can t tell you that it's a it's a more uh, complex spacecraft. Um, but we equally try to um, increase the launch rate being, again, very careful to do this in a safe manner. See, I'll follow up. So, so we, um, you, you have it right. The contract really is through uh, 2015 to order services and 2016 to, to complete the provision of services. Uh, today, uh, the launch rate is, so we're assuming something on the order on average of about three uh, SpaceXs and two orbitals a year to, to uh, make that happen. Uh, the shuttle had provided uh, so many provisions uh, in its last two or three flights that we have been really in good shape relative to uh, logistics for the crew. And so uh, as, the, as we've gotten to a little more, as we try to get to a little uh, higher tempo of, um, of flights to the International Space Station, we've been okay uh, because of what the shuttle did for us. Today, I would tell you, uh, we look at the rates and, and move things around. Um, we will get all of our flights uh, in, or we'll be able to get all of our flights in by 2016. Um, however, we're also now looking at the follow-on procurements um, for the for services to the International Space Station. The plan probably is to extend the existing contract one or two years. Uh, and then uh, and then have a uh, full and open competition for the follow-on through the life of the International Space Station. That's all uh, being sorted out today um, in, the, in the next few weeks. Uh, so, uh, but that, that's kind of what the plan uh, sort of starts to look like. All right, let's go to the phone bridge where uh, we'll start off with Elizabeth Howell from Universe Today. Elizabeth? Hi, uh, this one is for Mike. Can you let us know where the spare parts for the MDM or the MDM itself is located on the station and uh, how many spares there are? Uh, this particular spare was in the lab, it's stored in the lab. And we have, I, I can't tell you how many MDMs, but we have um, a number of MDMs uh, on orbit in different types. So we have external MDMs and we have internal MDMs and there's some variations between some of those, but they all use similar components. And so not only do we have uh, two or three other MDMs on board, we also have parts so we can build up different types of MDMs. But I, I don't have the specifics in my head. I do know that we're pretty well protected from a, a spare standpoint with MDMs. Okay. And uh, can you also let us know uh, what kind of similar failures have happened to this in the past, if any? Uh, this is the first EXT MDM failure we've had on orbit. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Tarek Malik from Space.com. Tarek? I also had a, a Space Walk question for, um, for Mike uh, Zafferdini. Mike, I was just wondering if, you know, we've, we, you, you, we, we, you mentioned that this was um, a replacement, like a Space Walk task that the crews are trained on, uh, one of those, those 12. And I just wonder if you could describe, I mean, is it some, something akin to just swapping out a box, uh, replacing a circuit breaker, uh, you know, that, that kind of thing? What, how, how tricky a task is it, and how long would you expect the spacewalk to take? Thanks. Uh, as far as the Big 12 goes, this would be one of the simplest we could do. Um, it's what we call a 6B box, and, and it just refers to how we plug it in and, and um, um, and uh, and remove or replace it. Once we move the MT, there's really no covers over it. Anything it's it's exposed, so it's relatively easy to get to. Um, it there's three uh, bolts we have to essentially turn. Two bolts and a micro conical that you turn that kind of uh, drives the big acne bolt that uh, basically unscrews it from its location. What is tricky about this one is the coal therm itself. 
Um, it it is likely that it's adhered to the um, the heat exchanger, the cold plate that's on the ISS. So there will perhaps be some uh, work involved to remove any that is stuck uh, on the cold plate, uh, and then of course to install the new one. The EVA is expected uh, from the time we uh, depress to the time we from the time we go outside to the time we come back in to be about two and a half hours. Um, it is the only thing we plan on doing on this EVA. We're just going to go out and change out that MDM. So the current plan is two and a half hours, so we have plenty of margin if it takes a little bit longer. Uh, in the big scheme of things, though, once we move the MT, this is one of the easier things for us to do. It's very close to the center of uh, S0, and so the trip from the airlock to its location is fairly short. All right, we have one more question on the uh, phone bridge, then we'll come back here. Uh, Robert Perlman from CollectSpace.com. Rob, go ahead. Hi, thank you. Uh, a question for Hans. Um, I believe the, via the Falcon is right now vertical. Uh, can you say if late stow has already occurred, or if not, when that's going to occur? And what are the late stow items for this flight? Yeah, it's a good point. Um, so the, uh, the late stow actually is, is, is uh, going to begin in, the, in this afternoon. It uh, will come, I thought actually it was coming down as we started the, uh, the press conference here. Um, and uh, as, as you pointed out, the next step is going to be the late load. Um, I'm not fully aware of all the parts that go into, into um, late load. There's going to be um, science payloads on there, uh, the uh, refrigerators. And uh, uh, I do know that it's a significant amount of late load. Um, I think it's close to 1,000 pounds. Um, so uh, we, we practiced very hard over the last couple of weeks to get this done in time and uh, be ready tomorrow morning. Okay. Thank you. Back here at, uh, back here at Kennedy Space Center. Hi. Uh, Val Phillips for Zero G News for Mike. In respect of the um, connector for the MDM, you mentioned that it wasn't the one that's specific for that particular model. Is that going to cause any issues, and are you going to need to go back and kind of put the right one on? Yeah, it's not a connector. It's a material that we put on the, on the interface to the cold plate. It's relatively thin. It's looks like a gasket material if you stared at it. So it's a thin kind of gasket material. Um, it already has some on there, so it's not thick enough. We're going to put uh, a, another layer on. Um, and we have one on orbit that we could modify if we had to. Uh, so if we if we just use the ones coming on SpaceX, it'll be pretty easy. We're just going to, it just sticks on uh, the existing material that's already there. Um, the Probably the bigger challenge is when we remove the old uh, MDM from its location, and as I said earlier, there's probably some adherence of this material um, to the cold plate outside, and we'll have to scrape it off. Um, but in the big scheme of things, it's that's not a this is not a big deal. It's not like a connector or something. It's um, it's a pretty simple interface. Jay Patterson with CTTechJunkie.com. Um, I think you've sort of already answered this, but that cold therm, um, as you said earlier, the kind you need is not on the station. Uh, it sounds like it's been manifested on CRS-3. Is that a late manifest is, is with late stow, or is that was that already intended to be sent up on this flight? Uh, no, it's a late stow. We figured out uh, about midday yesterday that we didn't have the right material on board. Um, we uh, called Boeing. Boeing called Honeywell. Uh, they brought it out to an airport where one of our T-38 jets picked it up, uh, and then they brought it back here last night and took it to KSC this morning. It's there now and will be part of the late load uh, later on um, this afternoon. Thank you for help. <laughs> okay, Irene. Thanks. Um, Irene Klotz with uh, Reuters. Um, uh, two quick ones for Mike and then one for, Han, for Hans. Um, aside from the solar array positioning and then moving the MT for um, um, unpacking the Dragon trunk, is there anything else at all that the um, um, that if there was a failure of the primary MDM would impact Dragon docking any cameras or I assume the robot arm is fine. Um, it's on a different system. Uh, not given, no, not for the next failure of an EXT MDM. Now, there, there are other failures that can take out the EXT MDM, but we have to deal with that. Those, those would, we'd have to deal with separately anyway. But 
Um, assuming no other failures, just the EXT MDM itself, we, uh, those are the things we had to do to be able to have uh, the Dragon come in birth. And then once it's birth, it's just part of station. We treat it the same. A little more power, but not, not a lot. Thank you. And um, uh, for Hans, um, is uh, SpaceX still... <laughs> If if the if the Falcon 9 is able to launch this week, is SpaceX still on track for the? Um, I think it's an Orbcom. I'm not sure. Sorry, the launch later this month. And could you run through the timeline a little bit for the restart of the uh, first stage, and uh, the, and through splashdown or touchdown? So. Um, <laughs> Opcom, Op yes, uh, is still on, on schedule for um, the end of the month. Um, we we hope we get off the ground here on, on the 14th. That would uh, help us. Um, and regarding the schedule on the uh, or the timing sequence on the first stage, um, I don't have the numbers in my head. Um, there's an entry burn, which is relatively long. Um, I want to say seven, eight minutes, and then there's a landing burn. The um, By the time... The, the the stage is um, you know landing on the water so to speak um, roughly by the time the second stage goes into orbit it's a very short would it land um, kind of touch down vertically and then fall over yeah that, that that's what we, we expect because obviously it's water yeah and, and there will be cameras on your ship there's or? cameras on the ship um, the ship has however a safe distance so um, that's also a reason why we don't expect uh, necessarily footage of that okay thanks. Interspace.net, and my question is for Hans, following up on what Irene asked. I want to just point out what I said earlier. This is, this is an experimental thing, and, you know, this is the attempted timeline. How, that's how I would call that, yeah, just to be clearly understood. You promise to say all that? Will you let us see the video? <laughs> <laughs> if I have a video, I mean. <laughs> yes. My question is about the instrumentation and the communication. Is it good enough that you'll have information in real time as it's coming down and you'll know how it's performing? Or is it more an issue of you, you see what the result was when you have the result? So um, the, and this, this refers to the first stage again? Yes. Um, so I think the, the important part is to, to collect um, data on these experiments and, uh, and figure out you know, if it worked well or if we have to, to do further improvements. I don't think it's, it's, it's uh, important to have this in real time. We like to see it in real time because obviously, you know, many people worked on it and, and are excited about it. But um, it's, it's also, it's, it's far out below the horizon. So there's technical difficulties getting data back and that's, uh, um, that, that's the other side of the story, basically. Okay, we'll, um, we'll give the last question to James Dean. Thanks, James Dean, Florida today again. And, and Hans, if, if you should pull this off and, and get uh, an intact recovery of, of the booster. I was just wondering if you could sort of lay out next steps. Um, how soon might we see an attempt to come back to land? And just sort of what's the company's you know, thoughts about what's realistic about a, a land, landing on land and, and you know, potentially achieving that, that reusable booster? Um, I, I guess it depends largely on how this experiment works out. And we, as I said earlier, we do this step by step. So we look at the results of this one, and then we, um, we adjust the timeline or, or um, you know, make, make modifications or, or do um, basically improvements. And um, the, the overall goal is uh, to get back to land by the end of, end of this year. However, that's a, 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 a challenge. Um, and you know, if we pull this off, as you say, we, we'd be uh, super thrilled. Go ahead, James. I'm sorry, quick follow-up, but, but would the, the, fir the, the landing back on land, is that definitely, would that be done here, or could it be done other places? So that's, that's currently an evaluation. We, we're looking at uh, different landing sites. The next Falcon 9, too? Um, yes, I think so. But don't quote me on that. <laughs> <laughs> and I know I should. Um, We'll go ahead and uh, take another question here from Jason as well. Quick follow-up to Irene's question. I was just wondering if you know, you're know you starting to fly commercial missions. Um, have, has any of the, the customers voiced any concerns about the landing legs or they're totally on board with it? Or you know, has there been any of that kind of dynamic at play or concerns about them? It's, 
pretty much like what Mike, Mike um, Safadini said earlier. Um, you know, there's there's an evaluation on 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 the risk basically, and uh, we we did all the right tests and all the right analysis. Um, we uh, provide the insight into that, and um, and then uh, then I guess that that that. Um, is being approved by the customer, so uh, this this is not not something that we just just do. It's, you know. And yeah, okay. Uh, sorry, I'm done. I'm done. You're done. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to go ahead and close. Uh, the headline is uh, SpaceX is go for launch. Yes. Uh, Four fifty eight p.m. tomorrow. Our next televised event uh, from the same room here at two p.m. Eastern time will be the SpaceX Science and Technology Cargo News Conference. Uh, if anyone is uh, willing and interested in participating by the phone bridge, please call 321-867-2468 by 1.45 p.m. Thank you very much for coming.